Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning to you again. And welcome to the next lecture of our uh, series of uh, public program of topics that are actually pertinent to the current toy and exhibit the National Gallery of Prague has prepared. And I'm very happy to tell you that today we have the immense pleasure and honor of uh, having with us uh, Megan Forbes, who was one of the scholars and experts who uh, who contributed immensely to the project and also to the catalog. So you uh, you can read her text on the uh, Toyan's book production. And also uh, Megan very kindly agreed to be available to your questions. So if you would uh, would like to know anything, anything uh, further about the topic she will be covering today in her talk, pretty please uh, listen closely and don't hesitate to let us know what you would we would like to uh, you would like to hear from Megan. So uh, that's all from me. Megan, it is yours. Thank you very much, Jitka. Thank you to Alana Stierbova for all your organization of this program, to Jitka Soshova for moderating today, and of course to Anna Pravdova and the full curatorial team for inviting me to participate in the exhibition as a catalog contributor and in today's lecture. I'd also just like to briefly say thanks to my friends and colleagues who have been such generous and generative interlocutors in discussing the material that I'll be presenting today. So since the 19th century, it was something of a rite of passage for Czech writers and artists to make the journey to Paris. In the interwar period, members of the leftist avant-garde group Devietsil, of which Tolkien was a member, made repeated and at times lengthy visits to Paris, and their adventures are well documented in the books and magazines that they published. Vitislav Nezval's 1936 surrealist account Ulitsa or Rouge et le Cour is a keystone text in this regard, as it recounts in a dreamlike fashion the wanderings of Czech surrealists around Paris, often with members of the French circle, including André Breton and Benjamin Perret. Nesval had been accompanied on that trip in 1935 by Jindřich Sturski and Toyen, who had made their first visit to Paris some 10 years earlier, their travel supported by an inheritance that Sturski had recently received. Earlier talks in this current series, hosted by the National Gallery in Prague, have extensively covered Toyen's interwar Parisian activities, including lectures by Anna Pravdova and Bertrand Schmidt. These talks, as well as the current exhibition on Toyen at the Waldstein Writing School and the accompanying catalog, provide much information about the work that the artists produced while in Paris in the mid-1920s and their robust exhibition schedule there. For today, I zoom in on a rather unusual item in Toyen's oeuvre, which was a product of their first extended trip to Paris, a tourist guidebook, and I use this publication as a catalyst to look more closely at the Paris that the artist was mapping. The Prouvotse par Gigi à Ocolim, or A Guidebook to Paris and Its Environs, was co-authored by the journalist Vincent Znechas, Sturski, and Toyen, and was published in 1927 by Odeon, a publisher that was loyal to the avant-garde and the Devietsil group. The book appeared as the sixth in the Mala Editze, or Little Edition series, directly followed by a seventh volume titled Par Gijvenotze, or Paris by Night, in the same year. This slimmer volume was basically an excerpt from the more comprehensive guidebook focused expressly on the nightlife of Paris. Both of these books were advertised as essential guidebooks to acquaint Czech travelers with the City of Lights. By way of introduction to the guidebook to Paris, I will briefly offer an overview of the place that Netchas, Sturski, and Toyen's guidebook can be understood within the larger tradition of travel literature at the time. In a contemporary review of the travel guide that appeared in the literary magazine Kmen, Josef Hoch simultaneously highlighted the, the status of the book's authors as, quote, Czech artists living in Paris, end quote, and the exceptional use value of the book. He encouraged the reader, go to Paris, so that you see their life, that you meet the bustle on the boulevards, the intensity of the pleasures of Paris by night. Hoch also compared the new book to the popular Bedeker travel guides, while concluding that the Czech guidebook to Paris is, quote, singular in all travel literature, end quote, with regards to its scope and overall importance. The Bedeker editions, produced in German, French, and English, and printed in Leipzig between the years 1828 and 1945, were iconic, with their red covers and pervasive use, so much so that their design became an emulated standard by other publishers. 
The 19th edition of the Baedeker Guide to Paris was published in 1923 in German, and English and in French in 1924. And it was perhaps this edition that served as a model for the Czech Odeon publication in 1927. When looking at a Baedeker guide alongside Nechas, Dursky, and Toyen's travel guide, we can immediately see that they feature a similar red binding and format, though the Czech version is about twice as long. The publishing house Odeon itself underscored an association with the Baedeker guides. On the back of another little edition book titled Plani Pergige, or Plans of Paris, the guidebook by Nechas, Sturski, and Toyen is advertised with the claim that it, quote, surpasses the Baedeker guides in interest, precision, and comprehensiveness, end quote. Besides its maps and plans, a main selling point of the guidebook was its significant number of photographs, 22 in total, which include reproductions of the Place de l'Opera, Montmartre, Saint-Michel, and the Eiffel Tower from across the Champ de Mars. And this image also was featured on the title page of Paris by Night and the cover of Plans of Paris. For the most part, these uncredited photographs appear to be available stock tourism images of major monuments, which Odeon recycled across their various Paris publications. But the photographs on a dust jacket for the guidebook to Paris are of a different sort, which capture the faces of laughing clowns and the legs of showgirls, the Eiffel Tower from below, and a streetscape from above. These more closely represent the kind of imagery and angles of a constructivist photography that was so popular in Deviatsil publications from this period. It is in fact perhaps the most striking difference between the Baedeker guides and the Czech guidebook that the latter actually featured a dust jacket that would have obscured the red covers. While I have personally yet to see this wrapper on the hardcover version of the guidebook, suggesting that it is very rare, a soft cover version, shown here, apparently features the same cover design. The cover art features photographs cropped into triangles wedged together to display two aspects of the city of Paris. The ruckus life of the cabaret and circus are featured in one color, distinguished from the order and geometry of the Eiffel Tower and city streets that cut along the Seine in another color and the actual color combination varied in different printings. While the artwork is uncredited in the guidebook to Paris, it is also reproduced on the back cover of Plans of Paris, and there, the signatures of Sturski and Toyen are clearly visible in the lower left. Sturski and Toyen were in fact prolific designers of book covers in this period, both for Deviatsil publications as well as more popular editions. Yinjik Toman's presentation on Toyen's work in the field of book illustrations in this series richly visualized the impressive scope of this practice. The cover of the guidebook to Paris fits easily within the avant-garde design work in which Toyen was occupied. To offer but one example, here is Sturski and Toyen's cover for the theater director Yinjik Honzel's revolving stage, which similarly features a showgirl turning to face the reader as she ascends a ladder along with the deep sea diver. It also makes use of geometric shapes, here in the form of rectangles rather than triangles, to divide and organize the picture plane. Thus, Sturski and Toyn's cover art for the guidebook is one significant way in which the book is marked as belonging to the sphere of avant-garde artistic production. And indeed, another way in which the Czech guidebook to Paris differs significantly from the Baedeker guide is in its truly comprehensive consideration of contemporary art. While the trio of Nechas, Sturski, and Toyen compiled a volume of over 800 pages that provided the standard fare of train schedules, metro stations, museums, restaurants, and cafes, it also listed theaters and cinemas, studios and galleries, even the addresses of authors and artists, to which I'll return later. In comparison, the 1924 English language Baedeker edition to Paris offers only a cursory overview of art in an introductory, introductory section briskly walking through French art from the Middle Ages to the 19th century. It then laments that the contemporary arts are in a crisis of style, quote, seeking inspiration here and there in the work of former periods and centuries and handicapped by the standardization of articles made by machinery, end quote. A rather different analysis of the present day art world is preferred in the Czech guidebook, which elaborates extensively on ways in which the Czech tourist might access the living art and literary scene. Therefore, though the Guidebook to Paris and Paris by Night are not avant-garde publications per se, they were on the other hand produced by members of the Czech avant-garde. 
and thus almost surreptitiously expose the middle class tourist to a more literary and artistic side of Paris than they might have been seeking. A close look at the guidebook in comparison to other publications of Deviatzel, as well as to works produced by members of an international artistic milieu, helps to answer the question, what can a guidebook tell us about the avant-garde sphere? It also helps us come to a better understanding of Toyen's day-to-day -day life in Paris in the 1920s in the absence of any real textual any real textual evidence left by the artist. With the guidebook, the authors employed a form that they themselves may have used to first find their way around the city and both worked within its standard form and transcended its typical expectations with their own publishing endeavor. So while the guidebook to Paris may appear on first glance to be a run-of-the-mill tour guide in the Bedeker tradition with no real artistic merit, it in fact serves as a unique example of a project through which avant-garde artists actually reached a larger audience beyond the rather small sphere of like-minded colleagues and collaborators. The extremely comprehensive guidebook would be accessible to a Czech middle-class audience with the means and ambition to travel. And while I've introduced the travel guide within the context of early 20th century tourism in Europe, I'll use the rest of my time today to discuss the ways in which it reveals the intersection of the Czech artistic milieu in the 1920s with a wider group of avant-garde artists and writers living in Paris. And I offer a closer examination of what that city actually preferred its artistic visitors. In this way, the book offers up a fascinating insight into the lives lived by its authors while in Paris. This is an especially intriguing line of inquiry with regards to Toyen, as the travel logs are the only work attributed to them that are not directly linked to their role as an artist and illustrator, but rather as an author, working within an almost exclusively male cultural milieu. When we look at the red cover of the volume, it is notable that their adopted full name of Toyen appears out of alphabetical order between the last names of their co-authors, as if to showcase their place within this project. Further, I consider the guidebook as a map of the artist Toyen's own wanderings through the city of Paris, read alongside their sketchbooks from the period. There are few accounts available regarding how a guidebook to Paris was assembled, but from a passage in Vyacheslav Nezval's memoirs, we can surmise that Nechas, Sturski, and Toyen worked individually to collect research for the publication. The poet recounts that it was Sturski who divided up the day's work for researching and assembling the book's content. Nezval writes, every morning Sturski would delegate tasks amongst his co-authors and in the evening typically receive them with great curses if they did not execute his plan. As we attempt to, re to reconstruct in more detail Toyen's work as a collaborator on the guidebooks, their personal sketchbooks from the period serve as a site in which we can find documentation of the way in which they moved around Paris and the sites that they visited and likewise better understand how this exposure to the city informed their artistic practice. Notably, in a small scrapbook compiled in January 1927, at the very beginning of the year in which the guidebook was published, pasted in tickets to the cinema and circus, together with sketches of a figure occupying these spaces alone, documents the person in relation to the city. They also take the metro, sit in a cafe, shoot target practice, walk city streets in the rain, and wait at the train station. There are short descriptive captions in French to accompany the illustrations, a rare instance of writing produced by Toyen in this period. These captions, which narrate the activities of the figure in each drawing, do not employ the feminine pronoun elle or she, but rather on, which is commonly used to indicate we in informal speech in French and typically translated as such, both in English and in Czech. However, its older and more standard usage corresponds to a nonspecific one in English, as in one should always do their homework. And on always and on always conjugates according to the third person singular, even if being used in the sense of we. Indeed, Amya Srinivasan proposed on last summer as a particularly flexible non-binary pronoun in the London Review of Books in an extended review of Dennis Barron's What's Your Pronoun? Srinivasan wrote, quote, the French on, which is grammatically analogous to the English one, sexless and singular, but lacks its pretentious overtones and is commonly used, declines variously and thus more pleasingly, end quote. 
A reader, Simon Torresinta, responded that the delightful ability of on is even greater than Srinivasan suggests, precisely inasmuch as it is used as an informal alternative to nu or we. At any rate, in the case of Twine's sketchbook, a close look at the illustrations themselves might cast doubt on an interpretation of on to mean we here, but can rather be understood as an indefinite singular pronoun, as the figure we find on nearly every page is decidedly not in communion with other people. The figure traverses the city always alone, save for the company of a cafe cat. The question of on and its usage in Toyen's sketchbook is relevant to raise here, as the life and work of Toyen asks us to think beyond binaries. In her essay, The Impossible Toyen, Malin Sternstein writes critically of scholarship that has tried to inscribe Toyen's fluid performance of gender within, quote, an assumption that desire is not a continuum, but an either or male or female, hetero or homosexual, end quote. Rather, we can find all these possibilities in Toyen's artistic practice and self-presentation. And for this reason, I have made the decision to use the pronoun they when referring to the artist for this talk. I'm at the same time cognizant of the fact that this does not reflect common parlance of the time, nor does it lend itself easily to translation into the Czech language, and also that Toyen's own positionality has so often been constructed through the words of others in ways that risk obfuscating the artist's representation on their own terms. By choosing to refer to Toyen with the pronoun they, I do not mean to speak for the artist nor suggest that this would have been their own choice today, but rather I aim to use this pronoun to acknowledge the ways in which Toyen operated outside of an either or paradigm, and also to platform the ongoing contemporary conversation about Toyen's gender identity and acknowledge the importance of making more space for this discourse generally. And anchored as this talk is in a consideration of the Paris the, that the artists mapped together with Netchas and Sturski, it is also productive to consider the question of Toyen's own self-fashioning within the context of gender play and more liberated approaches to sex and sexuality in Paris in the Roaring Twenties. We might consider, for instance, Marcel Duchamp and his alter ego of Rose de la Vie, or the surrealist photographer Claude Cahoon, who, like Toyen, was a, was a friend of André Breton. Jen Doy, in Claude Cahoon, A Central Politics of Photography, calls Cahoon, quote, a female dandy, but also unclassifiable and indeterminate. Words we might, we might argue could also apply to Toyen. The author also notes that it was common in interwar France and elsewhere for women to play with new modes of dress and that, quote, there were many overlapping and contradictory meanings of women with trousers, short hair, and cigarettes in the 1920s, encompassing bohemian and artistic lifestyles, refusal of gender roles, feminism, political radicalism, and upper class chic, end quote. And specifically in the context of interwar Czechoslovakia, Martina Pachmonova, in her lecture in this series in June, offered further examples of women at work and leisure wearing pants. Claude Cahun's play with multiple identities in her iconic photographs offer an illustrative, but certainly not sole example, of what was a particularly salient trope of the interwar period. It is a common characteristic of the time that artists, writers, and performers across Europe were notably imaginative in their own self-presentation, drawing from aspects of their immediate environs and the wider world. This embodiment of an alter ego or other extended beyond a play with gender, but also towards adapting aspects of different cultures. It would therefore be remiss when we consider the ways in which Toyen and other avant-garde artists in Paris transgressed all kinds of boundaries, not to situate this impulse also within the contemporary context of colonial France. Over two decades ago, Antoinette Burton argued in the introduction to gender, sexuality, and colonial modernism that, quote, if modernity in all its incompleteness and instability was made through colonialism, its unstable foundations must be traced to the slippages and ruptures of colonial sexual and gender politics, as well as to those of political economy and national policy, end quote. While artists and poets of the interwar period are often depicted as radically breaking down boundaries, they were also, there were also many limits to an ostensibly progressive European modernist project, embedded as it was in colonial patriarchal power relations. 
The current retrospective exhibition of Toyin has generated a robust conversation about how the artist experienced some of these limits with regards to the question of gender in particular. At the same time, more work remains to be done in critically examining how their work problematically inscribes stereotypes of non-European subjects stemming from their time in Paris. As has been commented upon frequently, the Parisian circuses and variety shows had a major influence on Toyin's work of the 1920s. In an earlier sketchbook than the one shown previously, likely dating to 1925, we have additional evidence of the sites Toyin visited, which were of influence to their artistic practice. A striking set of pages show groups of female dancers, in one case as the sword-fighting Gertrude Hoffman girls at the Moulin Rouge, and in another performing the legend of the Nile at the Folie Bergère. In this dance, white European women perform as ancient Egyptians, and Toyin has captured the overtly sexualized nature of the performance in her sketchbook. While these renderings of ancient Egypt do not relate directly, temporally or geographically, to the history of French colonialism, they are emblematic of an imperial impulse of acquisition and uncritical appropriation, which made its way into much avant-garde performance and art making of the time. In the 1925 sketchbook, we have a sense of the artist as observer, looking at the city from some distance and recording what they see, even making notes for future paintings. Returning to Toyin's 1927 sketchbook, however, it seems as though the artist has dared to enter the frame of action, and it is tempting to read the person in the sketches as Toyin themselves. The figure wears the same outfit in all the drawings, a crosshatch pencil skirt, button blazer, and broad-rimmed hat, thus suggesting a diaristic self-portrait. The clothing also notably resembles Toyin's attire, captured here in a photograph from a vacation in Brittany a year later. At the same time, the restrained observational quality of the drawings in which the figure is always an outline and captured at a distance would suggest the detached documentation of another person. At any rate, it is clear that we are following the same person through the whole narrative who is themselves observing other action, suggesting that a body in motion is always a body in dynamic relation with its environment and that the body and the space it inhabits are in a sort of mutual flux. To look at Toyin sketchbooks from 1927, alongside the publication of the Guidebook to Paris from the same year, is one way in which to think about the artist's agency as a person walking about Paris in the 1920s. The specific places indicated in the captions or on ticket stubs in the sketchbook, such as the Café de la Rotonde, Cinéma d'Anton, Cirque d'Yves, and Vieux Colombie, all ultimately figure in the guidebook. Even if the division of labor is not clear in the tour guide itself, thanks to Toyin's scrapbook, we do have a mapping of the places they visited and moved between that ultimately made their way into the normalized genre of the tourist guide. Toyin was evidently on the move and with a clearly defined purpose. We do not have here the aimless or anonymous wanderings of the flaneur in the Baudelarian sense, even if the sketches do present an element of leisure and laissez-faire as, at least as long as the money holds out. For indeed, money was an issue for these avant-garde Czech artists in Paris. In one drawing towards the end of the book, for instance, Toyin has written on an otherwise empty page, there is no more money for entertainment. On the following spread, Toyin has drawn the same figure that was previously seated at the Café de la Rotonde, apparently enjoying a glass of wine, now with their head in their hands and no drink on the table. The accompanying text reads, they are broke. This can be interpreted as a biological sketch, a biographical, excuse me, sketch, as Toyin and Stursky needed to pick up odd jobs in Paris in order to make ends meet. As Nesval described in his memoirs, quote, they tried to earn a few francs each day with various work and washing dishes in a hotel was not the worst of the jobs that they took on, end quote. In a way, the guidebook itself might be considered one of these jobs, though I have not come across any documentation about the fee that they received for compiling the book for Odeon. And apparently Nechas was in even more dire straits, as Sturski and Toyan reported in a letter to Yinje Honzel dated May 14, 1927, that their co-author had absconded from Paris, leaving a trail of debts behind him. Visits to the Café de la Rotonde, as they appear in Toyan's sketchbook, could perhaps have been justified as a business, business expense by the struggling artists. 
Indeed, the cafe receives a lengthy treatment in the guidebook in which it is characterized as the meeting point of modern Paris and a place in which an international milieu of artists would gather, including Amadeo Modigliani, who apparently fell out of favor with the management for becoming verbally aggressive after a few glasses of wine, also Pablo Picasso, Georges Braque, and Guillaume Apollinaire. The Czech reader might be interested to learn that there is also a Slavic contingent at the cafe, and Trotsky himself went there regularly. The entry in the guidebook on the Café de la Roton is followed by a much shorter entry on the Café du Dom, which the authors describe as a central meeting point for Americans, but which also saw German and Scandinavian visitors during World War I, and was likewise frequented by Trotsky, along with Luna Tartsky and their circle. In the guidebook, it is emphasized that the Café du Don is located across from the Café de la Roton. This geographical situation is illustrated too in Toyen's sketchbook, where the figure stands at a crossroads of sort, with each cafe on either side of her and the court of Montrouge to her back. To their back. While Toyen's sketchbook shows a lonely figure in a Paris that is almost eerily vacant, the guidebook teems not only with locales to visit, but the contact information for some of its most notable personalities in a contemporary arts and literary milieu. It includes the home addresses for such figures as Jean Cocteau, André Breton, Yvan Gaulle, and Tristan Zara, and the ateliers of Fernand Leger, Man Ray, Constantine Bracusi, Pablo Picasso, Max Ernst, Robert and Sonia Delaunay, Theo van Doisberg, Natalia Goncharova, Francis Picabia, Georges Braque, and Sugaharu Fujita, among many others, as well as two Czech artists, Sturski himself and Josef Shima. Notably, Toyen is absent. At the time, Sturski and Toyen had separate studios. Sturski is at, Rue, at 74 Rue de Moulinvert, which is the address listed in the guidebook, and Toyen's at 160 Rue de Chateau. Also in the guidebook, an extensive chart of private galleries is provided, which predates the well-known 1930 French reference guide, Le Collectionneur de Peinture Moderne, or the Collector of Modern Paintings, and comprises nearly all the same addresses. An introduction to the guidebook section on modern galleries makes the claim for, quote, Paris as the artistic center of the world, end quote, not for its museums and collections, which the authors note are also impressive in other places like London and New York, but for, quote, the atmosphere of the art market from the sidewalk exhibitions of painting to private galleries and salons, end quote. More so than Toyn's 1927 sketchbook then, the Guidebook to Paris offers a glimpse into the art world its authors inhabited while in Paris on this early trip, together with, of course, documentation of their exhibition schedule, correspondence, and photographs, much of which is made visible in the current exhibition at the National Gallery in Prague. And while the guidebook is written in Czech for the Czech traveler, the scope of its engagement with an ostensibly international, albeit within the limited confines of an almost entirely European milieu, is a significant aspect of the book, and one that also conjures comparisons with the wider book production of other emigres and visitors to Paris in the interwar period. One notable example is Mina Loy's Lunar Baedeker, a volume of poems first published in 1923. British-born but peripatetic poet, artist, and even gallerist, Loy, a feminist who was vocal about her fierce sexuality, spent much of the interwar period in Paris, arriving for her second extended trip in 1923 and staying until 1936, when she immigrated to New York. Though Loy is not one of the authors or artists that receives attention in the guidebook to Paris, it is nevertheless interesting to consider it alongside the lunar Baedeker. Loy's book of poems does not in any way aim to serve as a practical guidebook, and in fact, the title references a map of the moon rather than any urban, earthly setting. But while the lunar of the title suggests the more cosmic scope of these writings, the book also pointedly takes on the household name of the Baedeker guides as a sort of shorthand to indicate that the poetic contents of the volume are grounded in the author's own earthly travels throughout Europe, Latin America and the United States, namely in New York. As Susan Rosenbaum, Rosenbaum has written, Loy's, quote, Loy's Lunar Baedeker not only maps the temporal, geographic, and aesthetic relationships that defined her career, but breaks new aesthetic ground, ground that Loy figures as the landscape of the moon, end quote. 
In the opening poem, which bears the same name as the volume itself, the line, and immortality mildews in the museums of the moon, reflects a desire not to exist for all time, but rather perhaps beyond time, or at any rate outside of one's own time, with its constructs and constrictions on more pluralistic ways of being. Lloyd's poems map the author's perambulations as it muses on the self in relation to the body's physical environs and its intellectual interlocutors, lovers, and children. In an introduction to a compilation of Lloyd's poems published under the title The Lost Lunar Baedeker in 1996, Roger L. Conover asks a series of questions regarding Loy that with some tweaking might also be applied to Toyin. Did she know how precociously her language assailed the fortresses of gender, he asks? Did she lead the avant-garde in adopting a guise of transgressive femininity as a masquerade? And how much control did she have over the publication of Lunar Baedeker? We might consider Loy's Lunar Baedeker alongside Toyen's 1927 sketchbook and the Guidebook to Paris as various strategies for mapping out an avant-garde landscape, both in the public and private sphere, that enabled their authors to live outside certain to live out certain ambiguities and abstractions. The evident difficulty in situating a figure like Loy, as with Toyen today, points not only to the limits of an avant-garde milieu in which they operated, but in our own language and thinking. Unlike the case of Loy, from whom we do have a legacy of her own words through which to understand her relationship to an avant-garde artistic and literary scene, her own sexuality, and the urban spaces she occupied, with Toyen, there is a notable and highly significant dearth of words. This has allowed their story to largely be written by their contemporaries, and they have been given significant attention in memoirs of former Deviatsil members written decades later. Even in the case of Loy, who did choose to write for herself, Conover notes that while she appears in dozens of biographies by figures such as Ernest Hemingway, Ezra Pound, Gertrude Stein, and William Carlos Williams, quote, in memoir after modernist memoir, she has been granted a forceful personality, a cerebral bearing, a perfect complexion, a sexual body, but not a voice." End quote. The situation is similar in the case of Toyen, and I will close with a notable example from Rougi Lecour, Nesval's travelogue that I mentioned at the outset of his 1935 trip to Paris with Dersky and Toyen. In one scene in the book, Toyen fades away almost quickly as she appears. The poet writes of rushing along the Boulevard Saint-Michel because, quote, I had a meeting with Toyen on the terrace of the Taverne de Palais, and I did not want to leave her waiting on me, end quote. Upon arrival, though, he runs into the French surrealist Benjamin Perret, sits down at his table, and Toyen is not mentioned by name again. Did Toyen also join them in conversation? Nesval does not say. Rather than reading Toyen between the lines of the writings of Nesval, Seifert, and others, I rather look to the works that bear Toyen's own name in order to glimpse their story on their terms. And I pose an open question in closing. How would Toyen have written themselves had they chosen to do so? Or, considering that they opted not to, how can we more fully turn to their paintings and illustrations, sketchbooks, and even the Paris guidebook to form an understanding of their self-presentation and the ways in which they flirted with notions of the other as their mode as an artist and way of operating in the world? What can the public object of the guidebook and the private artifact of the 1927 sketchbook tell us about Toyen's personal experience of Paris? I would propose we continue to look at these items more closely to form a fuller picture of the artist that does not look away from the more problematic, ambiguous, and uncertain aspects of their oeuvre while maintaining a focus on their practice and production. Thank you. Well, thank you, Megan, for your wonderful talk. I have to admit it has certainly shed a lot of light for me on, so far, very little known aspect of science work. And if you don't mind, I have prepared a couple of questions because I'm genuinely curious, so I would, I would love to know. Uh, well, I was actually wondering the most about the historical context, because we are talking about 1920s, we are in the decade that immediately followed World War One, and that was a time when a lot of things changed for a lot of people, and obviously there was a lot of social changes, but also a strong resistance to them, 
and as a result, it's a it's a decade full of full of change. And also in your talk, as well as in your text, uh, you've mentioned that the guidebook actually had a specific intended audience. So could you perhaps tell us a little bit more about who typically would have the privilege of traveling in in Europe in the 1920s? Yes, thank you so much for that question. Um, so what I find particularly interesting about the guidebook and which what first drew me to it was the aspect um, that it would have been a wider publication that might have reached a larger audience than a small cohort of avant-garde actors and artists. Um, the David Sill publications, which were of course very leftist leaning and progressive and imagining a new world and radical social change um, and aiming to meet a sort of um, large population kind of in their homes and on the street, um, were in reality, I think, uh, talking more to themselves and to a broader international avant-garde milieu. So the ways in which the magazines that David Sill published were circulated internationally is very interesting to look at, the way they signaled um, their alignment, for example, with what was happening in Germany and elsewhere uh, through a visual language um, is very interesting uh, because most of the publications were, of course, in Czech and that was not a language accessible to their colleagues <laughs> abroad. Um, but the guidebook was something that really did seem to be intended for, um, uh, as I said, a middle class uh, Czech traveler with some means. It looked like a Bedeker guide, so they might just have uh, taken it and um, gone to Paris. But then once you look more closely inside, and it, I think it has been largely overlooked because it really does look like a, just a standard tour guide. But when you look and you see that there are all these addresses of artists and um, writers, their home addresses and so forth. Uh, there are long commentaries in, in a section on uh, cinemas. Then there's like a long commentary on French film theory <laughs> and so forth. Um, so there were these ways in which they were kind of uh, sneaking in a kind of avant-garde message in this more mainstream publication. And um, when we look to other women of the avant-garde, for example, if we look at Milena Yesenska or Maria Mayerova, who are publishing cookbooks or children's books and so forth, there is this sort of um, uh, avant-garde uh, set of product publications that really did reach um, a kind of wider audience and maybe even directed towards women or children and so forth uh, that you don't see, for example, in the Devitzel magazines. <laughs> Uh, actually, I'm, I'm so glad that you uh, mentioned the Devietzel publications because that was another thing I was wondering about. Uh, exactly as you said, a lot of the avant-garde discourse is basically very likely-minded people talking to each other across state borders and also across very many times actually like of knowledge of mutual mutual language but yeah, we have images so they uh, they managed but uh, perhaps uh, can you tell us something about the well the Vietzel book publications in general honestly because also uh, you have you have mentioned yourself that uh, both Toyan and Sturski and also great many their uh, their comrades from the Vietzel, they were interested in that aspect of of of, um, artistic work basically so they also doubled in uh, uh, graphic design as we would put it today so what was actually the books that uh, David Sill poured their money resources and time into yes thank you for that question and this is a topic that is of great interest to me um, oh I can see the sparks <laughs> Uh, I'm currently writing a book manuscript called Technologies for the Revolution, um, in which I talk extensively about the ways in which David Sill um, uh, sort of utilized new technologies in print towards their book and magazine production and used then those publications as a way to propagate their message both in local contexts in uh, Czechoslovakia and then within an international milieu. Um, the You mentioned resources. and um, uh, the the book and the magazine was actually a relatively um, humble place in which to engage with new technologies and um, um, in a relatively affordable way. And whereas maybe film production was of great interest but not accessible to David Sill. Um, so the books are really uh, unique in that sense. And then also, as I previously mentioned, the, the magazines um, 
were very actively distributed abroad and talking through this language of new typography through the images that were reproduced uh, could really talk to this wider sphere. Um, and then a, another economic consideration is how those images themselves were obtained and printed um, and were exchanged. Um, the actual like uh, printing blocks or the photographs to be printed were exchanged across an avant-garde. And so you see once um, the the money has been sort of invested in um, making a printing block of a photograph. You see that uh, same image appear in many publications as a way to make the, mo the biggest bang for their buck. And so that's why I also mentioned in the um, lecture briefly, but it's very interesting the way uh, certain images of Paris appear across all three of the publications I mentioned. So the, the, the big guidebook, Paris by Night, the slimmer one, and then the, the book that's just the maps or plans of Paris are all recycling um, the same images. You can see Odeon cutting some corners there economically. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking how very ecological of them. So basically they would have a set of, well, stock photos, formal, like physical one, but still stock photos. And they would, uh, they would use it in different contexts. So even though you have a set of photographs, you don't have a set of fixed meanings. So you can, you still have something to, to play with. And in terms of genre, was there, was there any preset of, um, of interest that we know of? I mean, you mentioned you mentioned uh, Mayerova and Yesenska. So, you know, I actually read the cookbook and I also unfortunately have to admit read the children's story, which kind of scared me for life. So I am wondering if Deviatil also had the, uh, something specifically in mind in, in that aspect or if they were open to whatever their members kind of like pitched in. Uh huh. Well, of course, there are the sort of iconic Devitzel publications, which are the uh, volumes of poetry by Seifert and Neswell and so forth. But one thing that I'm really interested in that they were actively um, publishing were translations. So from the French avant-garde or from Soviet uh, film theory uh, and, and so forth. Um, so I, the, their publishing kind of um, calendar, I guess you could put it, was quite diverse. Also a lot of theoretical texts by Taiga. Uh, he, you know, was uh, putting out thousands of words a year, so many words, and was publishing them then quickly in anthologies of his own writing. So film from 1925, which we compare, can compare to Laszlo Moholy-Nagy's painting photography film from the same year um, and so forth. So basically, it was mostly a vehicle for theoretical theoretical thought, and they were tr really trying to broadcast what is their, let's say, new way of thinking about the world. So we have pretty much a plethora of interests that are just like held held together by the by the publisher. So they are kind of putting their own spin onto it, but there isn't, uh, at least it seems so, there isn't uh, any pre-existing set of rules like we will publish this, but not this. I have to admit, kind of kind of reminds me of the fut uh, futuristic or futurist really uh, manifestos because you know they have something on painting and architecture and sculpture, and one could certainly expect that. But I certainly didn't expect a manifesto on futurist uh, cuisine. That was somewhat uh, new and shocking to me. So I'm um, wondering about if Deviatil had something, uh, something like that. Uh, I also has to have to have to admit that I admire the ease and elegance with uh, with which you uh, you dove into the as you put it robust conversation about gender and gender performance very nicely done, and it also made me think about the concepts uh, that you that you use both in today's talk and also in your wonderful text in the in the catalog, and in here today you have uh, you have mentioned uh, Claude Cahin the female dandy. Uh, in your text, uh, you are talking about Toyen as a flaness, which would be the female version of uh, flaner, a concept that we know from Benjamin mostly. So could you perhaps talk a little bit more about that notion, for instance, why it was so interesting to the Parisian circles uh, or even artistic circles, not even necessarily merely Parisian circles uh, of the time? Yeah, absolutely. And actually, to your earlier question as well, and the, sort of a two part thing, but they're connected through, the, I think, a question of influx. Um, because Deviatil, I think you put it as they were in for, information or something, but really it was a, in real uh, uh, poetism information over mm -hmm. time. 
when you look at, for example, Karl Teige's letters to Artus Czernik, and also it's important to remember, in 1920, when David Sloan was formed, they, they were 20, um, and in their letters you really see them uh, working through these ideas, and so the um, publishing program changes so dramatically, and that's its own talk, right, but it uh, changes so dramatically over the 1920s uh, based on um, uh, constant re revising of their ideas. So um, basically, you so sorry. So basically, you have you have like somebody's um, I don't know social feed media on your hands. If you're dealing with that as a topic of your research, you actually can genuinely see the changes the changes in their thinking and how it translated into the discourse that was put out by the publishing house. Yeah. Well. And one more thing on that, which is interesting and so important, is that in that moment uh, we have like 300 letters or so, or pages of letters from Taiga to Chernik, because Chernik was living in Brno, so um, there was the necessity to write. If Chernik had been in Prague, like Seifert, for example, we, from whom we also have quite a bit of correspondence with Chernik, um, we wouldn't have this this written correspondence you say like a social media feed. So there, there's nothing worse for our history than neighbors come on we need we need the correspondence we need the uh the text but so sorry i have uh i've interrupted you please continue no oh, absolutely um to you to your other um question about uh toyan as flanus as i raise it in the um in my catalog essay and have since sort of revised my my own <laughs> thinking. Um, I've been, uh, well, so the, for, let's just say to start, the concept of the flaneur and the question of there can, if whether there can be such a flan thing as a flaneuse, that is a woman who can walk the streets unnoticed, anonymous, and so forth, um, that kind of preoccupied me from the beginning of my looking at um, Toyin's guidebook, you know, that she created with uh, Netchas and Sturski, and then uh, when I saw her sketchbooks, that question was even more um, pre present for me. Um, and it seems that in those 1927 sketchbooks, the the figure in each of those images has s sort of managed to escape the gaze or the male gaze, or um, is is uh, unobserved, but precisely because they are all alone. Mm -hmm. Um, but then, uh, in thinking about this more, I mean, Toyin was not uh, wandering, as I said in the talk, uh, without purpose, um, and just sort of seeing where the day took them, but rather was um, <laughs> seemingly at Sturski's behest, going out and, uh, you know, taking notes and bringing them back for this guidebook that they had, you know, apparently been commissioned to do for Odeon. And then additionally, since I made the choice to use the non-binary pronoun of they when speaking about Toyin today, then uh, the question of Flanus also uh, becomes complicated because, as you said, that's gendered female. And um, was thinking about, is there then such a thing as a Flanux? <laughs> or or, or um, is there another term that could be productive to use uh, in this case? Um, but again, with this uh, thinking about her as uh, thinking about Toyin as someone who's in, intentionally walking the streets, the question kind of um, it has started to um, dissipate for me. Um, but I would just say, uh, I think that in this case, we're definitely not um, looking at the, the flaneur in the Benjaminian or Baudelarian <laughs> sense. So no botanicizing of the asphalt. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, I was actually I was actually thinking about that as well myself because as you said, Flanner is somebody who is just wandering through the city for mostly their own pleasure and there is no purpose to it. But also, it's a bit more complicated by we don't have the Flanner nor the Flanes, we have the representation of that. And representation typically is actually made to be looked at. So you would have kind of an ambiguous situation on your hand with that. You can uh, you can also argue that you have the performance of being a somebody who wanders aimlessly, but it is it's merely that performance for somebody to somebody to behold. So uh, it also kind of made me think, uh, would you think it would be fair to say that even though the figure in the sketchbook is gendered, typically it, it, the, the person in, in those drawings is, uh, is uh, clad in female fashion, so skirts and dresses and such, uh, do you think uh, we, can, we can speculate about uh, the experiences basically that uh, there were brought was it like a female experience or was it made to be like modern experience for for everybody is there something untypical for the for the women of the time to experience and enjoy 
Thank you. Well, I was trying to tease that out in bringing in character, uh, other person, like artists, like mm. uh, Moon, for example, and thinking, I mean, also if we think beyond Paris, um, this was just a common trope of the 1920s of, um, of uh, performing and playing out different uh, uh, gender position or sexuality and um, a recent book by Elizabeth Otto on the Bauhaus also you know documents that ex extensively um, this form of um, experimentation and play that was happening there so in Germany but amongst an international or pan-European view mm. as well. So basically the same circles who would be talking to each other so even though we are in Germany we are basically among friends. <laughs> yes, and I, I was, you know, for today's, the purposes of today's talks, rooted in this uh, guidebook to Paris, thinking about the um, context of mm. Paris itself. But yeah, it's not um, particular to to that city. Um, so I, I think it's really important in thinking about the way that, um, that Toyen played with gender um, and self-presentation and, and dressed in different ways, named themselves Hoyan, took on a, a name um, that this was, um, this, that this should also be understood as recognizable within the context um, uh, of, of the Roaring Twenties in, in Paris. Actually, what seems to me that you just did uh, very, uh, very cleverly is to frame it as a question of self-presentation. Because obviously self-presentation is something that has been part of concept of the artist since, well, since the early modernity in Italy, truly. Renaissance artists would know a little bit something about, about that. So yeah, that could be also a very useful perspective to employ when we are trying to understand this. This is very ambiguous and uh, very intriguing part of, uh, of the of the Toyans ever and uh, their existence. Well, um, sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, I, I wanted to say that uh, it was lovely and sign off. So very please continue. Oh, well, I just wanted to say that if we um, think of gender as an act or something that's enacted, then it's particularly productive in the in the case of this talk, let's say, to thinking about, and I tried to highlight this, of um, the, the body in space and moving through the city and this idea of a flux um, to think beyond any sort of um, static and locatable um, set of constructs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Plus, uh, if we try to translate the, uh, literally and um, figuratively, if we're trying to translate the discourse into Czech, there is also a little bit of linguistic trapping because typically in Czech, if you're talking about performance, there is this understanding that performance always includes certain pretending or artifice that it's that it's not. Mm -hmm. true or uh, or actual in the moment so yeah that's that's kind of interesting to keep in mind that we might also think about a different concept for it in uh, in our own uh, language uh, language bubble so to speak well uh, thank you so very much I, I genuinely don't uh, I don't exaggerate when I say that I, immen I immensely enjoyed that so thank you so much for uh, for waking so early for us I also do appreciate it very much and I'm sure that our audience is as well um, we're very happy to know uh, to know something about Toyan's uh, collaboration with other artists and I'm sure that next time we're all going to Paris we will we will do our best to uh, get the copy of the guidebook and just follow the uh, follow the step for, for the steps of Toyan and her and her peers. So Megan, thank you so much for being up with us here today. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.